Now we'll move on to discuss the joints of the upper and lower extremities. We'll begin this section by discussing the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint, or glenohumeral joint, is a ball and socket diarthrosis joint. It's depicted in this image. It involves the humerus and the scapula. This joint permits a wide variety of movements, including flexion extension, adduction, abduction, circumduction, and rotation. In this joint, the ball of the humerus fits in the glenoid cavity of the scapula, which is a socket. The glenoid labrum extends and deepens the joint and provides attachment points for the glenohumeral ligaments, the biceps brachii muscle, and the flexor muscle of the arm and shoulder. The stability of this joint comes from the associated muscles and ligaments. Some of the ligaments involved in the shoulder joint include number one, the glenohumeral ligaments, these stabilize the joint, number two, the coracohumeral ligaments, this supports the weight of the arm, and number three, the coracoacromial ligament. This spans between the coracoid process and the acromion to support the surface of the joint capsule. Another joint in the region is the sternoclavicular joint. And this is a joint between the clavicle and the manubrium of the sternum. This is a synovial joint made up at the end of the clavicle and the manubrium and it functions to anchor the scapula to the axial skeleton. This joint permits movement of the clavicle in the anterior, posterior, and vertical planes. The capsule of the joint is reinforced by accessory ligaments. The interclavicular ligament interconnects both the clavicles at the manubrium. The costoclavicular ligament extends from the costal tuberosity of the clavicle to the superior border of the first rib and costal cartilage. This ligament stabilizes the joint when the shoulder is elevated. A joint between the upper and lower arm is the elbow joint. It's made up of the humerus, radius, and the ulna bone. The elbow joint permits two main movements, the hinge-like bending and straightening flexion extension and the turning of the forearm during the movements of pronation and supination. This hinge diarthrosis joint can be divided into two portions. Number one, the humeral ulnar joint, and number two, the humeral radial joint. The humeral ulnar joint is from the trochlear notch of the ulna to the trochlear humerus. This is a hinge joint that allows flexion and extension movements. The humeral radial joint, from the head of the radius to the capitulum of the humerus, is also a hinge joint. The humeral ulnar joint is a stronger articulation. The entire elbow joint is a very strong and stable joint because the boner surfaces interlock. The articular capsule is also very strong, and the reinforcing ligaments of the joint contribute to the strength of this joint. In the wrist are the carpal joints. The intercarpal joints are planar diarthrosis joints that permit slight gliding movement. And these joints are between the carpal bones themselves. The carpal bones are the trapezoid, trapezium, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, the hamate bone, and the capitate. The ligaments that stabilize the wrist are Number one, the palmar radiocarpal ligament, which connects the distal radius to the scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrium bones. Number two, the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. This connects the distal radius to the carpal bones. And number three, the ulnar collateral ligament. This extends from the styloid process of the ulna to the triquetrum bone. Also, the intercarpal ligaments interconnect and stabilize the carpal bones. The carpus or wrist is made up of eight carpal bones. The wrist joint includes the radiocarpal joint and the intercarpal joints. 
The radius bone is involved in the radiocarpal joint with the three carpal bones, scaphoid, lunate, and the triquetrum. This joint permits flexion and extension, adduction, abduction, and circumduction. The radiocarpal joint is a condylar diarthrosis joint. The first joint of the lower limb we'll discuss is the hip joint. This is a ball and socket joint. The joint permits flexion extension and a limited amount of rotational movement. This joint is made up of the femur and the hip bones. The head of the femur fits into the acetabulum, which is the socket. And the acetabular labrum, which is a circular rim of fibrous cartilage, increases the depth of the socket. The articular capsule of the hip joint is strong and contributes significantly to the stability of the joint. The image on the right is an anterior view of the hip joint. This joint is reinforced by ligaments, including the iliofemoral ligament, which extends from the ilium to the femur. It prevents the trunk from falling backwards when in a standing position. Also, number two, the ligament of the femoral head. This can be visualized in the image. The ligament of the femoral head originates along the transverse acetabular ligament and attaches to the center of the femoral head. This ligament functions when the thigh is flexed. The image on the right side of the slide shows the knee joint. This is a lateral view of a bent knee. The bones include the femur and tibia, as well as the head of the fibula. The patella is connected with the quadriceps tendon and the patellar ligament. The knee joint is a complex articulation that functions as a hinge. This joint permits some degree of rotation as well as flexion extension movements. The knee joint functions along with the hip and ankle joints to support the weight of the body. The knee joint connects the femur bone with two articulations, one between the femur and the tibia, and one between the femur and the patella. The knee joint is a complex articulation that's made up of two joints that are contained within a complex synovial capsule, one joint between the femur and tibia, and the second joint between the femur and the patella, or kneecap. The knee joint includes more than one capsule and synovial cavity. The lateral and medial menisci are between the femoral and tibial surfaces. And these cushion and conform to the shape of the articular surfaces of those bones. The patella is embedded in the patellar ligament. And the cruciate ligaments, one anterior and one posterior, attach the intercondylar area of the tibia to the condyles of the femur. The ankle joint. The ankle joint is a hinge diarthrosis joint made up of articulations between the tibia bone, the fibula, and the talus bone. This joint permits dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot. The ankle joint includes the following portions. Number one, the tibiotalar joint. This is between the tibia articulation and the trochlea of the talus. This joint is the primary weight-bearing joint of the ankle. Number two, the proximal tibiofibular joint. Number three, the distal tibiofibular joint. And number four, the fibulotalar joint. A number of ligaments along the length of the tibia and fibula bones hold these two bones in place. The articular capsule of the ankle extends from the distal surfaces of the tibia and the medial malleolus of the fibula and the talus bone. The medial deltoid ligament and the three lateral ligaments function to prevent the ankle bones from sliding side to side. There are also a number of joints in the foot. The foot contains a large number of joints between each new segment of bone, for example, between the tarsal bones. The tarsal bones include the calcanus, talus, navicular bone, cuboid bone, 
and three cuneiform bones. Also in the foot are metatarsal bones one through five, proximal, medial, and distal phalanges. All the joints of the foot are diarthrosis joints that permit movements such as gliding movements, flexion extension, or adduction and abduction. The four groups of synovial joints in the foot include number one, the intertarsal joints. These are articulations between the tarsal bones themselves that permit slight gliding and twisting movements. Number two, the tarsometatarsal joints. These are articulations between a tarsal bone and a metatarsal bone. These joints permit some sliding and twisting movements. Number three, the metatarsal phalangeal joints. These are condylar joints between a metatarsal bone and the proximal phalange. And number four, the interphalangeal joints. These are hinge joints between two phalanges that permit flexion and extension.